Well, today we're going to continue with our mini-series, Great Prayers of the Bible, and today is part three. And if you remember over the last few weeks, we've been trying to look at the subject of prayer and, and looking at the great prayers of the Bible. But let's always be reminded that prayer isn't just um, a, a kind of vending machine where we put a little prayer into a machine and try to get the blessing of God out of it and then we forget about God. Prayer is more than just asking God for stuff, although it does mean that as well. It, prayer is about spending quality time in God's presence. It's about not just looking at what he's got in his hands for us. And God has so much for you and for me. It's about just spending time looking longingly and lovingly into his face. It's about that marvellous time of worship when we're totally surrendered to him and we're just gazing into his beautiful face and, and listening to what he's saying to us and also talking to him. Not just about what we want and that's important, not just about making intercession for others and that's really important, but just sometimes sharing our life with God, telling him about the good things that we've seen, thanking him for the, the wonder of creation, thanking him for our friends and our family and for the good life that we have and sharing those moments when we discover new things and we're excited about something and, and talking to him. We so often pick up the phone and tell our friends and family when we've discovered something new or good news is abounding and yet prayer is about spending time with God, telling him about our good news as well. Of course God sees everything, he knows everything but it's really special to his heart when you just come and spend some time with him and tell him just about your day, speaking to him as your wonderful friend, your father in heaven. We know that prayer is powerful. John Sidlow Baxter, Baxter once said, men may spurn our appeals, they may reject our message, they may oppose our arguments, despise our persons, but they are helpless against our prayers. Keep praying for your lost friends and family. Keep praying for miracles because, because God has promised to hear and to answer our prayers. In our first week, we looked at the prayer of Jabez and we discovered that our God is a God that can bless us. And when we have a heart that's right to say, God, will you bless me? Will you make me a, a person of influence for the kingdom? Will you, Lord, cause me to know your presence and be kind to me and pour out your blessing upon me? When we have the right kind of heart, God delights to pour out that kind of blessing. Not that we can keep it all to ourselves, but that we can give it to others. That we can express uh, and ooze the love of God and the blessing of God to those that we come into contact with. Last week we looked at the prayer of Elijah and we saw that this one man who had faith in God, who expected God to do something, prayed for rain. He prayed for revival. He prayed for God to turn things around and to bless the nation and God heard his prayer. We learned that Elijah prayed with expectancy. We, we saw that he prayed with this sense of humility. And yet he had an urgency in his soul. He couldn't leave it any longer. He couldn't go and celebrate because God's fire had come down upon Mount Carmel. Because uh, he had dispatched the, the enemies of the people of God, the demonic prophets of Baal. No, he had an urgency. I've got to pray. I've got to see revival. I've got to see miracles. I've got to see God move in my land. And that was his urgency of prayer. And when nothing seemed to be working, God was working as we were singing earlier this morning in that lovely song, Waymaker. He prayed persistently and God did something amazing. So let's think about another person today. Let's think about Hannah for a few moments before we go home for our lunches. Hannah, in the Old Testament, prayed for a child. That was her great prayer. She longed to have a child. The context of this great prayer, it takes place primarily in a family home. So I guess we can all relate to it because we're all part of God's family, but we're also um, part of our separate families in a, a human way of looking. 
In 1 Samuel, you can read particularly about Hannah praying for a child. Elkanah and his two wives, Hannah and Penina, lived in the mountain country of Ephraim. Penina was very cruel to Hannah because Hannah was termed as being barren. It's a, a kind of horrible label, barren. It, it, it sounds horrible. But that was the label that people gave at that time to women that for some reason could not have a child. Hannah was not able to have a child. And in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, we read, Each year Elkanah would travel to Shiloh, to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of heaven's armies at the tabernacle. The priests of the Lord at that time were the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. On the days Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Penina and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. Hannah had been unable to conceive children. Now that's quite hard for us to get our heads around because for many of us, we've had the joy of having children in our families. And that has been a joy and rejoicing of our hearts. And yet there are many women in our world today who are heartbroken and longing to have children. During Old Testament times, uh, a childless woman would actually be considered a failure. That's another terrible label. Her barrenness was a potential, potential social embarrassment to Alcana. It, it was a potential embarrassment. There's something wrong with her. She can't have a child. You can imagine the cruel things that people said, and even the cruel things that Penina was saying in the home. Children were a very important part of the economic structure at that time. They were a source of labour for the family. Well, it's not today, is it? I can remember trying to get my kids to fill or empty the dishwasher. <laughs> that was a hard job. But back in Bible days, when kids obeyed their mums and dads, they would maybe make the fire maybe collect the water and do things for the family. They were a source of labour and it was also their duty to care for their parents in their old age. If a wife could not bear children, she was <coughs> obligated by the ancient Middle Eastern custom to take hold of her servant girl and to give her servant to her husband. And maybe through the servant, lady or girl, the, the, she would be able to have children. And we see this, don't we, in the example of Abraham and Sarah. Sarah couldn't have children. And so she gave Hagar, her servant girl, to Abraham and said, we will have children in our family. If I can't physically have a child, we'll do something about it. And Hagar will bear forth children for us. Elkanah could have left Hannah because as a husband at the time, he was permitted to divorce her if she couldn't provide a child. But he chose not to. He chose to love her despite her inability to conceive. And we know that Hannah was desperate, absolutely desperate, longing for a child. And sure, she did all that she could, naturally speaking, to have a child. She would sleep with her husband and yet nothing seemed to be happening. Hannah did all that she could and then she prayed. She did all that she could and then she prayed. And sometimes we need to do what we can do. God moves mountains but he often uses your shovel. And we need to honour the Lord and work with him. He's not some kind of heavenly genie where we rub the lamp three times, you know, and suddenly pops up and we get three wishes. 
Now, God wants us to be working in partnership with him. We are his children. He is our father and he wants us to work with him. And there are times when we have to do what we can do. God, I need a breakthrough in my finances, you might say. Well, maybe you need to sit down and actually look at your finances and put together a budget. Maybe you need to look at how you're spending your money. Maybe you need to consider, actually, you know, my finances aren't being blessed. Are you tithing? Are you giving generously to the work of God, as the Bible says? We need to do what we can do, and then God steps in and does what he can do. Elkanah loved God. And he took his family to a place called Shiloh. And at Shiloh, the tabernacle, the tent of God was present. And there God's tangible presence could be felt. It was there at Shiloh that um, the sacrificial offerings were given to God. And around that time, it appears that the, the men of faith would have to go with their families three times a year to Shiloh to worship the Lord. The Bible tells us that Elkanah would take his family to go to worship God. He took his family to worship God despite the problems that they had in the household or the tent. Many families have big issues right now. And it might be even in your family, as you're sitting here in the house of God, you've come to Shiloh, you've come to the place of God's presence, you've come to a place where you can bring the sacrifices of praise and worship to break bread and hear the word of God and, and listen to the Holy Spirit. But it might be that you've got problems. There are families that have problems conceiving children. There are families that have problems with difficult children. There are families that have problems with their finance. Other families are facing terrible problems when someone in the family has cruel addictions, maybe to alcohol, maybe to drugs, maybe to gambling. But I'm sure every one of us in this room today can think of somebody, maybe in our immediate family circle or in our neighbourhood, that has some kind of addictive issue. And you know that it causes such heartache and brokenness in the family. There are problems all around us. Some families are absolutely shattered because of the problems with infidelity. But let's get it straight. There is no perfect family. Aren't you glad about that? There is no perfect family. Even Joseph and Mary kind of left Jesus behind in Jerusalem. You know, they weren't perfect either. There's no such thing as a perfect family. One day we will be perfect. Amen? Amen. One day, but right now we are on a journey. We are being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. And God is lavishing his love upon us and pouring out grace upon grace upon us day after day. Hey, we really do need amazing grace in our lives. But we're not perfect yet. There is no perfect family. But let me say this. Despite the problems you and your family might be facing right now, there is always hope when you follow the example of Elkanah. When you make a decision, despite the difficulties, I will put my coat on and I will go to the house of the Lord. I will go and worship. I don't feel like worshipping. I don't feel like clapping my hands. I don't feel like dancing. I, I don't feel like doing it because it's been a terrible week. Everything that could possibly go wrong has gone wrong. Uh, uh, the children are playing up. The car's broken down. All sorts of things are happening. And it seems like our family feels so dysfunctional at the moment. I, I just want to get off this merry-go-round. We've all been there at times. Because that's reality. There is no such thing as a perfect family. And yet, there is hope for, for us all when we decide to come to the house of God. When we decide to come into God's presence, when we come into his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts, with praise upon our lips, and when we decide that although it's tough, I'm still going to sing, I'm still going to worship, I'm going to bring the sacrifice of praise. You see, 
When we come to the house of God, we pray and we give praise to God. Praising will help you take your eyes off the problem and fix them upon God Almighty. If you analyse the words of the songs that we have been singing this morning, those songs are like a vehicle that help us to grow in our faith and to focus clearly upon God Almighty. As I was praising this morning, my vision of God was getting bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter and more glorious. What about you? Amen. God is good. Amen. He's a big, big God. He's the God who created the universe. And when we praise God, it's like taking the magnifying glass or the binoculars or the telescope and suddenly we're God is enlarged. He is so much bigger. And we always seem to leave the house of God feeling better than when we came in. Praising takes our eyes off the problem and upon God Almighty. And when we pray, something miraculous happens. You see, when we pray, we, we place the problem that is consuming our minds and worrying us and giving us anxiety and maybe possibly even causing ill health. When we pray and we place these things in God's hands, something miraculous happens. God's peace is released into our hearts. A peace that the Bible says passes our human understanding. It, it's beyond our mind's understanding. We should be running around like headless chickens. And yet when we give that problem to God, he imparts that supernatural peace into us. How incredible is that? So after an evening meal with the family, Hannah goes to the tabernacle and she goes to pray. Everybody else is watching Strictly Come Dancing. But she needs God. She needs to somehow, like a sponge that is dry, to soak up the presence of God. She needs God. She's desperate for God. God is the very air that she breathes and her lungs feel like they're just desperate. She's got to somehow get God in her life. And so when everybody else is doing something enjoyable and there's nothing wrong with that, she finds the presence of God. 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 10. Hannah was in deep anguish crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord and she made this vow oh Lord almighty if you will look down upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son then I will give him back to you he will be yours for his entire lifetime and as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord his hair will never be cut as Hannah sat in God's presence as she was praying this prayer, as she was pouring out her words to God, it seems like, as we read the scripture, that her words began to dry up. Sometimes it happens to us all when we're praying. We pray and we cry and we sob and we pray and we shout and we walk up and down our front room maybe or we walk up and down the street or somewhere else and we're just crying out to God and it's like we're just pouring it all out and then our human words dry up. But when her human words dried up, it was like she was still praying. Her lips were moving, but there were no words coming out of her mouth. And, and Eli, the priest, looked at her and thought, yeah, she's drunk. Fancy coming to church drunk. But she wasn't drunk. She was a woman with a burden. She was heartbroken. She was desperate for a child. And she was doing what she could do. By spending time with her husband. But it just wasn't working naturally. She needed something supernatural to happen in her life. Do you need something supernatural to happen in your life? Then you need to pray. Because I'm not the answer. And the person sitting next to you is not the answer. I love you. And the person sitting next to you loves you. We are a church family and we love one another. 
But at the end of the day, we know at Millpool that only God is the answer. Only God, only God can answer this kind of prayer. And yes, Eli thought she was drunk. But you know, the Spirit of God helped Hannah as she sought the Lord. Doesn't it say in Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses? For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. Somehow as Hannah sat in the presence of God. When she ran out of human words and yet the burden was still there. Somehow she felt she hadn't yet discharged that burden of her heart. As her mouth was still moving. But there were no human words coming out. The Holy Spirit worked through her. And when you get to a place of prayer. When you're desperate to see your sons and daughters come back to the Lord. When you're desperate for that healing miracle. When you're desperate for that breakthrough. When you're desperate for that job. When you're desperate for God to do something. And your words run out. The Holy Spirit will help you to pray. He is our friend. He is our comforter. He is the one that abides with us. He is the one that will help us. He is the one that strangely comforts us in those dark moments when we feel so alone and so desperate for God. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, once said, Groanings that cannot be uttered are prayers that cannot be refused. Isn't that powerful? Wow. When the Holy Spirit prays through you, when you get to that place of desperation and you surrender everything to the Holy Spirit and you let him pray through you, it's those groanings that are heard in heaven and they won't be refused because the Spirit is praying through you. Eli accuses her of being drunk. But Hannah says, oh no, sir, I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I'm so discouraged. I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I'm a wicked woman, for I've been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. In that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, Hannah said. And then she went back to the tent where her family were and she began to eat again. And she was no longer sad. They were all watching Strictly or something else. She was heartbroken. She went to the presence of God. She prayed until she had no human words left. But the Spirit of God helped her as he will help you. And then her prayer was heard. She left that place different. I promise you, when you find the presence of God through worship and prayer and his word, when you find the presence of God for yourself, and it doesn't matter if you're a young girl or whether you're an older gentleman, it doesn't matter who you are today or what your name is called but when you are hungry for God and when you find God for yourself and he will be found by you he doesn't play hide and seek when you find him because your heart is longing for him something amazing will happen Amen. God is a good good father Amen. and then it says and 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 19. When Alkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea. And in due time, she gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel, for she said, I asked the Lord for him. As I finish this morning, I want to tell you, our God is the God of the turnaround. Amen. Jeremiah 29. 11, you all know that verse. God says, I got good plans to bless you, to give you hope in the future. Most of us know that verse. But sometimes you've got to reach it a little bit further. And if you read a little bit further, you will see 
But in verse 13 of Jeremiah 29, God says, I will turn things around for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Is that a word for someone today? I will turn things around for you. Our God can cause a lady that cannot have children to be with child. And didn't we hear that amazing testimony from Glynis last week? Oh God, you're so wonderful. Our God can turn things around. If you feel like you're in darkness at the moment, if you feel like you're in inky black darkness and there's no light anywhere, the Lord is your light and your salvation. You do not need to be afraid. God can turn darkness to light. He can cause emptiness to overflow with such blessing you cannot contain it. He can turn captivity into liberty. He can turn sorrow into joy. He can turn anxiety and stress into his amazing peace. Oh, I'm so desperate to see new things born and coming to a place of birth. I tell you, I, I'm, I want to see amazing things happen at Millpool Hill Church. I thank God for Sundays. I thank God that we can come into this place and feel the presence of God. But you know, I want to see this, this building used for the glory of God. And I can't do all these things by myself. But I am seeing and I am hearing prophetically that there will come a time when cars will roll up on that car park and mums will come in with their babies and there will be mothers and toddlers and that there will be people coming into this church that have all sorts of issues and problems and there will be people listening and counselling them and praying for them and helping them. I am seeing things in the spirit and I believe that God is going to do great things amongst us. Thank God for Sundays. But there's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday for God to do something in this place. And I'm believing that God is the God of a turnaround. Yes. And that these great things will happen. And so I run my race by faith. And I say to you, run with me. Let's see God do amazing things amongst us. Let's keep on praying. I can hear some things like Elijah said last week, we heard. I can hear the rain coming. There was only a little cloud like the size of a man's hand but that didn't put Elijah off he could hear something in the spirit I can hear something in the spirit for Millpool Hill Church can you hear it God's blessing is there for us and we just need to move into it by faith we need to do what we can do and God will do what he can do so friends let's keep praying we might be in that place where we feel we toiled all night and we've caught nothing you might feel like that lady who, like Hannah, just couldn't have children and you're doing what you can, but it's just not happening. Keep praying. Keep believing. Keep pushing through because the breakthrough is coming. Let me finish by saying Hannah's prayer of desperation moved God's heart. God's heart was moved. God wasn't indifferent. He didn't turn his back on a weeping lady. His heart was touched. And I tell you, when you pray, from the depths of your soul, you touch the heart of God. He loves you so much. God doesn't hide from you. He delights in you. He sings over you. He longs to hear your prayer. Your prayer of desperation will move the heart of your heavenly father. Hannah, she, she kept a good spirit in all this. Her heart was right with God. The Bible says God had caused her not to have children at that point. She wasn't rebellious against God. She wasn't resentful. She didn't say to Alkana, you go. <laughs> Why would I want to go to Shiloh? It's God's fault I haven't had a child in the first place. No, somehow she just sucked it all up. But she kept a sweet spirit. And then Alkana's wife, Penina, giving her all that hard time. You can just imagine the the difficulty in that household, but she kept a sweet spirit. Eli, the priest, accused her of being drunk, but she kept a sweet spirit. Friends, you might be going for a hard time, but you are better than the world. You are better than the world. 
You are a child of God. And it is the spirit of God that dwells in you. Keep a sweet spirit. Keep a sweet spirit in all things. And then, even then, when she prayed, she sacrificed her desire. And she said, God, if you give me a child, I'll give them back to you. She was prepared to say, Lord, it's all yours. Even this thing I want more than anything else. Oh, God, I really want a child. I want a, I want a, um, I want a child more than anything else. But if you give me that child, I will give him back to you. Oh, wow. That's worship, that's sacrifice. We've mentioned three great prayers of the Bible recently. Hannah praying for a child. Elijah praying for rain, for revival. Jabez praying for blessing. Three great prayers of the Bible. Next week, there'll be another one that somebody else will bring to you. But you know, there's a great prayer that I haven't really specifically mentioned. And it's your prayer. God is waiting to hear from you this week. God is waiting to hear from you. And he's a busy God. He commands the universe. Yeah, God is busy. More super busy than you could ever imagine. Because he watches over every life. And he cares for every soul. But it's just like this. When you come to God, he clears the desk. And he says, Denise, I'm so glad you came. Tell me. Tell me what's on your heart, Denise. He clears the desk because he's got time for Denise. And he's got time for Bob. And he's got time for Stacy. Emily, he's got time for you. Phoebe, he's got time for you. God will clear the desk and he will sit and listen to you. I sought the Lord and he answered me. Seek the Lord and he will answer you. Some of the greatest prayers are yet to come out of your heart to God's heart. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.